Hello and welcome to the Prima Facie case. This is a uh, module offered by High Plains Fair Housing Center. Thanks very much to High Plains for inviting me. My name is Margaret Moore Jackson and I'll be talking to you about um, the ways in which the Federal Fair Housing Act can be violated. The many varieties of types of prima facie cases that can be articulated and some related information that should be helpful to all sorts of those parties involved in disputes about fair housing. First of all, please keep in mind that this is for informational purposes only and this presentation is not providing any legal advice and it does not create a lawyer-client relationship. So the Federal Fair Housing Act prohibits discriminatory housing practices when they're based on membership in seven protected categories, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. That's the main focus of today's presentation. Importantly, the Fair Housing Act also requires certain accessible features to be included in any multifamily housing that is built after 1991, but we will not be covering that portion today. Importantly to keep in mind are the dual purposes of the Fair Housing Act, and this will help as we go through the materials today, help it make sense as to why the way this law can be applied works in so many different types of situations, some of which may be surprising. So the dual purposes of the act are to end discriminatory housing practices and to promote integrated housing, truly integrated and balanced living patterns. And uh, courts have consistently interpreted this act as being entitled to a broad and generous construction in order to effectuate these dual purposes. And the Supreme Court has re reaffirmed this principle again, <clears throat> most recently uh, in 1982 with the language here in this slide that um, the purposes of the act are promoted in substantial benefits that flow to everyone so discrimination against one group is harmful to society as a whole. And here's a flow chart that was put together and shared with me by uh, a California lawyer named Christopher Brankert. And I'm gonna show this here and then we'll talk through it and then we'll show it again later. So uh, don't be thrown off, but it's intended to show that a remedy is provided to an aggrieved person under the Federal Fair Housing Act for discriminatory housing practices. And those come in several different types of varieties. And the, the statute itself uh, enumerates these kinds of violations under the subsections. And then pointing out to the left, you see there are some exceptions to the Fair Housing Act coverage, and we'll briefly go over those as well. So to put it a different way, the Fair Housing Act's available claims can be articulated as follows. The Fair Housing Act provides a remedy to an aggrieved person for discriminatory housing practices. And those are in, intentionally crafted to be stated as broadly as possible. And so to try to distill them into categories so we can keep track of them and learn what they're about, here are some ways of thinking about them. Discriminatory housing practices might be said to fall into these categories, rentals or sales, rules, statements, lies, and retaliation. So let's start with the remedies portion. The Fair Housing Act provides a remedy. Well, what are those? Prevailing plaintiffs in a lawsuit are entitled to recover compensatory damages, which include not only actual out-of-pocket and economic damages, but also emotional distress damages that are calculated according to the harm suffered by the aggrieved party. And this includes damages for things 
that stem from the experience of being discriminated against based on a protected category, race, color, national origin, religion. So the humiliation, the mental anguish, and those types of damages are quantified and recoverable. Also punitive damages, where it is shown that the um, defendant recklessly disregarded the established civil rights of the aggrieved party. And since the Fair Housing Act was enacted in 1968, the civil rights protected under the Fair Housing Act are very well established. Also, prevailing plaintiffs are entitled to recover attorney's fees that are calculated based on the hours spent by their lawyers and the prevailing hourly rate for attorneys in the community. So who's an aggrieved person that's entitled to claim these remedies? Standing to bring Fair Housing Act claims is extremely broad. Anyone who claims to have been injured by a discriminatory housing practice has standing as a plaintiff. And that includes persons who are only engaged in testing, checking to see whether fair housing laws are being followed or not. Testers also have standing. That includes fair housing organizations that serve a community by enforcing fair housing laws. So as you can see, this is very broad level of standing of who constitutes an aggrieved person and can sue under the Fair Housing Act. Well, who can be sued? Who are the defendants in these cases? The Fair Housing Act provides for individual liability and vicarious liability, such that all persons who engage in a discriminatory practice may be civilly liable, can be defendants in these cases, even if what they were doing was acting within the course and scope of their employment. This also includes uh, for liability, the principals, the homeowners, the property owners, the landlords, the property managers, and the employers of agents who engage in discriminatory housing practices. So that's where the vicarious liability comes in. If the agents or employees are engaged in discriminatory practices, then those who employ them and those who own the property that's being managed uh, or sold can be held vicariously liable. So let's start with the first type, loose category of discrimination that constitutes a discriminatory housing practice, rentals and sales. So the way this is articulated in the statute is that it's a discriminatory housing practice to refuse to sell or rent, to refuse to negotiate for sale or rent, or to otherwise make unavailable or deny a dwelling. And that's very all-encompassing language there that becomes important as we see in the cases. These kinds of prohibited practices with regard to rental or sales are discriminatory practices if they're engaged in because of someone's status in a protected class. So that includes such um, obvious examples as denying uh, housing to a qualified applicant or buyer, refusing to show something, a uh, dwelling that's for sale or rent, taking the housing off the market to make it unavailable to this person who's interested, this applicant, steering practices where the housing is, is uh, rented or sold, but the buyer or the um, potential tenant is steered away from available housing choices and steered towards other choices because of their status in a protected class. Lending practices um, also fall within this subsection, subsection A, because it's otherwise making unavailable or denying a dwelling if lending practices are done because of status in a protected class. And then this is also where zoning comes in, zoning practices or refusals to waive or amend zoning policies or ordinances because of status in a protected class can be sued under this subsection. So that's rentals or sales. Also rules was another one from the flow chart. This is a way of thinking about subsection B, which makes it a discriminatory housing practice to discriminate in the terms, 
conditions or privileges in the sale or rental of a dwelling or to discriminate in the provision of services or facilities in connection with the sale or rental of a dwelling. So this encompasses situations where the housing is sold or it's rented, but because of someone's membership in a protected class, they're offered the dwelling at a higher sale price or a higher rent or with a higher security deposit or with fewer services included or the financing is under less favorable terms. And this is also where harassment might be a claim because the person is there in the housing, but the terms or conditions or privileges are discriminatory because of someone's status as a member of a protected class. Here's another unique area of the Fair Housing Act, prohibiting statements. Subsection C makes it a discriminatory housing practice to make, print, or publish, or cause to be made, printed, or published any notice, statement, or advertisement with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling that indicates any preference, limitation, or discrimination, and so forth. So this is a very unique subsection that makes statements of discrimination about housing their own violation of the Fair Housing Act. This is why you really never see, <clears throat> almost never see rental ads or sales um, ads for housing that include language like um, no African Americans need apply or we don't accept people, <clears throat> we don't accept women, we're looking for a male tenant. Those types of things used to be commonly published in newspaper ads and they're not there anymore because if they are published, they're pretty much an immediate violation of this subsection. And here's another kind of violation of the Fair Housing Act or discriminatory housing practice which can be summed up with the word lies. So subsection D of the Fair Housing Act makes it a discriminatory housing practice to represent to any person because of status in a protected class that any dwelling is not available for inspection, sale, or rental when it is actually available. So that's its own separate violation. And then 3617 of the code makes it unlawful to retaliate, to coerce, intimidate, threaten, or interfere with any person in the exercise or enjoyment of their fair housing rights. Okay. Um, and then another area that we won't fully go into today, but I would not want to skip, is that all of these types of practices are discriminatory if they're engaged in because of someone's status as a person with a disability. But then there's additional provisions as to disability. The reasonable accommodation mandate of the Fair Housing Act includes within uh, the definition of discriminatory housing practices, the refusal to make reasonable accommodations to rules, practices, or services when the accommodation is necessary to afford the person with a disability equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. So let's look at a relatively simple definition or articulation of the elements of this failure to provide a reasonable accommodation as um, constituting illegal discrimination. And here's a way that some um, courts have articulated it. It may be a little different in each case because it depends on the context and the facts. But here, first element, the tenant or his or her associate has a disability. The housing provider or landlord knew or should reasonably be expected to know the disability. Three, the accommodation of the disability may be necessary to afford the person an equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling. Five, the accommodation is reasonable and, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up my numbers. Four, the accommodation is reasonable and five, the landlord refused to make the requested accommodation. So what I wanted to point out in going through the elements of this basic cause of action here for failure to provide a reasonable accommodation is nowhere in here 
do we look at the intent of the landlord or the housing provider? No intent is needed to uh, establish a violation by failing to provide a reasonable accommodation. And then I mentioned that there are some exceptions and those can be broadly described as particular housing developments for seniors are allowed if they qualify and if the housing development strictly meets the criteria for that exception, which has to do with the proportion of persons living there of a certain age, as long as those are met, then the housing development for seniors are accepted from the familial status provisions. Those are the provisions that forbid discrimination based on having someone who's a child in the household. So housing developments for seniors, if they qualify, can discriminate against families with children. They're not exempt or accepted from the other forms of anti-discrimination requirements. And then there are some very, very narrow exceptions for housing strictly reserved for members of religious organizations or private clubs. They do not come up very often and they're not really welcomed by the courts, but those exceptions are there when appropriate. And then there's uh, an exception for multifamily housing of four units or less with the owner occupying one unit. So for a fourplex, a triplex, or a duplex, that's known often as the Mrs. Murphy exception and would be accepted from the provisions of the Fair Housing Act. There's also an exclusion from Fair Housing Act protections with regard to a single family home sold or rented by a private individual owner who is um, not in the business of buying and selling and renting houses. So who owns not more than three houses, sells not more than once in 24 months, does not use a sales or rental agent, and does not use discriminatory um, publications or notices that violate the Fair Housing Act under subsection C. So there's another exclusion. Here again, looking at our flow chart, we have summarized the remedies available to the very broadly provided standing for aggrieved persons for discriminatory housing practices with regard to rentals or sales or the rules, terms, and conditions about rentals and sales, the special provisions that forbid discriminatory statements about housing uh, transactions, lies about housing transactions, and retaliation for the assertion of rights under the Fair Housing Act. And then moving to the left, we have a few exceptions. Now let's get into two main ways of proving with legal articulation of elements, proving that a violation has occurred. What would the prima facie case be based on? And the way to look at this would be going off in two main directions, disparate treatment and disparate effect, often referred to as disparate impact. You can see that those are two entirely different ways to um, prove that the Fair Housing Act has been violated, that a discriminatory housing practice has occurred. With disparate treatment, we're looking for intent. We're looking for a showing either through direct evidence or circumstantial evidence, or perhaps both, that what was going on was intentionally because of the aggrieved party or their associates membership in a protected class. With disparate impact, we're not looking for intent. There's a showing of the effect of the housing practice is disproportionately felt by those in a certain protected category. And if that is established, the, um, the defendant would still have an opportunity to justify the practice by explaining and providing evidence of the necessity of that practice to um, achieve or advance legitimate goals. And if that justification succeeds, 
there's still an opportunity for the plaintiff to show that those goals can be advanced or achieved with a less discriminatory um, alternative, or that they're actually, that this alleged, um, the practice and the alleged goals it's intended to meet are a pretext for discrimination. I mentioned that subsection C about discriminatory statements was unique, and that is because those types of cases are not articulated with regard to either a disparate treatment or a disparate impact. It's just whether the ad notice or communication indicates discrimination to a reasonable listener or hearer or reader, and there's no need to establish intent whatsoever for a liability to attach. There's a few more that I'm not going to have time to go over, but I just want to make sure that if you are looking into a potential Fair Housing Act violation, that you look at these additional subsections. Um, subsection E deals with what is known as blockbusting, where um, often it's real estate professionals would make representations about the entry of minorities into the neighborhood, and that was analyzed and is analyzed on a reasonable person standard with no need to establish intent, similar to subsection C. Um, also, uh, 42 USC section 3617, the interference claim, the, um, the inquiry is not whether the interference or coercion or threats were, were done because of someone's membership in protected class, but rather whether this interference was prompted by the protected behavior. So that's a little different. And then I've already mentioned that um, subsection F, which deals with disability, is looking into whether the defendant refused or failed to provide a reasonable accommodation. So there's no need to establish intent in that instance either. Well, let's look again at who can be sued. I mentioned that there's individual liability, that any person who is engaged in a discriminatory housing practice can be individually liable, and that there's vicarious liability there as well. So examples of how this pans out, <clears throat> owners of apartments, owners of single family homes, landlords and managers of those, real estate firms or brokerages, all can be named as defendants for these discriminatory housing practices. Rental agents, property management companies and managers. And then it gets into lending. So loan officers and lenders who are involved in financing a housing transaction can also be defendants if they engage in discriminatory housing practices. And insurance with regard to housing. Insurance agents can also run afoul of this, of this act. Any non-exempt party who violates the law can end up being named as a proper defendant. Well, what courts are we talking about? Where can these claims be sued? State courts have concurrent jurisdiction over Federal Fair Housing Act claims, so they can be brought right into state court under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And federal courts can also hear them, obviously, because there's a federal question there. And if, if brought into federal court, those federal courts would have supplemental jurisdiction of state law housing discrimination claims if they're part of the same case or controversy as the federal claim. So these federal law, the federal law that we're talking about today is substantially equivalent to the state law of many states, including North Dakota. There's no exhaustion of administrative remedies required. And by that, it's different from the process that's required in an employment discrimination claim or case based on federal anti-employment discrimination law, where a claim must be first exhausted through the administrative process of the EEOC. This is not required with regard to uh, fair housing law and housing discrimination. It's not required at all. Complaints must be filed in state or federal court, either one is available, within two years of the last date of the discrimination. So let's dive into some examples of disparate treatment and how to articulate that type of claim. 
a prima facie case might be articulated as follows, that the plaintiff, one, is a member of a protected group, like based on race, we all have a race, that number two, the plaintiff applied for and was qualified to rent or buy a certain property, number three, that the plaintiff was rejected, and number four, that the housing opportunity remained available thereafter. That's a really um, simple, straightforward look at a prima facie case, what a plaintiff would need to articulate to bring a claim under disparate treatment. And the fourth element is typically um, flexible, that the housing opportunity remained available, or it was rented to someone else, or whatever it was that happened. If you articulate that it, it looked like the plaintiff was qualified to rent or buy a particular property and was rejected, then it raises this rebuttable presumption of why in the world was someone rejected who was qualified, and it looks like it was because of membership in a protected category. That is the rebuttable presumption that the defendant would thereafter have an opportunity to rebut. So rebutting the disparate treatment prima facie case, if the plaintiff establishes a prima facie case, which is a low level of required um, proof or allegations, the burden then shifts to defendant to articulate a non-discriminatory reason why they refused the housing, um, refused the plaintiff the housing. Plaintiff, if the defendant is able to articulate a non-discriminatory reason, like your credit was not as good as the one I chose, or you did not have as many good references, <clears throat> or whatever the non-discriminatory reason for refusing the plaintiff the housing opportunity, then the plaintiff still has an opportunity to show that this reason articulated by the defendant is a pretext for discrimination or a sham. And one example of that would be that a court can, can infer discrimination or pretext if it's shown that defendant's explanation is false. So what are some examples, <clears throat> excuse me, of direct evidence of intentional discrimination, how a plaintiff would go about attempting to establish that the defendant's legitimate non-discriminatory reason was actually pretext. So direct evidence, statements that show or evidence some sort of racial or ethnic stereotypes or bias, statements made by the defendant, ethnic slurs, an admission by the defendant that reveals a bias against members of a protected class, some sort of letter, email, text message written by the defendant that indicates the defendant's desire to exclude or to impose different requirements on members of a protected class. These types of direct evidence used to be a lot more common than they are these days. So what we often see as a means of establishing uh, intentional discrimination or pretext um, is indirect evidence, circumstantial evidence, and that can come in a wide variety of forms. Maybe it includes testing evidence. Maybe it includes comparative treatment of different categories of people. They're treated differently and it appears to show circumstantially that it might be because of their protected class status. It could include statistics. It could include anecdotal evidence, uh, like a chronology of a sequence of events all sorts of things, historical evidence of um, who has been rented to or sold to in the past. And it can include things like um, in instances where we're looking at decisions made by um, governmental bodies or boards or organizations, zoning boards, legislatures. Those are um, often you're, you're going to have to look at indirect evidence because decisions are usually made for a wide variety of reasons. So let's look at a case where, um, where the discrimination is explained and the case articulation is explained, but it comes in a form that is not quite so obvious even to practicing lawyers. So in this West versus DJ mortgage case, 
So let's talk about the West versus DJ Mortgage case. This involved a property manager who was employed by a landlord. So the property manager interacted with a tenant, took her application, um, rented the unit to her, and then engaged in a course of conduct that included things like asking for a hug, grabbing her, and then in response to her text seeking repairs of the apartment unit, would do things like ask her out to lunch or dinner, uh, compliment her beautiful skin tone, repeatedly asking whether she had a boyfriend, and asking when she was going to give him nude photos. When the tenant complained, she was evicted. Let's see how these facts were um, analyzed by the court in a claim brought on her behalf. The former tenant, after being evicted, sued the former landlord, so sued the company for the conduct of this individual property manager and articulated three claims for violation of the Fair Housing Act, quid pro quo sexual harassment, hostile environment sexual harassment, and retaliation, that portion I mentioned under um, 3617. She claimed that the defendant's property manager harassed and sexually assaulted her. And the defendant, in response, after the case got going, brought a motion for summary judgment. What do you suppose the defendant claimed in that motion for summary judgment? Oh, well, before we get to that, let's reflect back on subsection B of the Fair Housing Act's prohibited practices. They include discriminating in the terms, conditions, or privileges in the rental of a dwelling, or discrimination in the provision of services. So uh, based on sex here was the claim under subsection B that the harassment was a discriminatory housing practice. Also, 3617, this coercion, intimidation, threaten, or interference for exercising their fair housing rights. Those were the claims. Defendant brought a motion for summary judgment, as I said, and asserted there is no recognized claim for sexual harassment. It doesn't say harassment anywhere in the statute. And in addition, the defendant claimed that this wasn't, these facts were not sufficient to support a claim for sex discrimination or sexual harassment under subsection B as either quid pro quo or hostile environment. And furthermore, embedded in this motion for summary judgment, the defendant said, we can't be held vicariously liable for this bad conduct, even if it was bad, the bad conduct of our property manager's harassment. Uh, there has to be some sort of establishment that we, the, um, the company, that employed the property manager were negligent, that we knew or should have known that he was engaged in this kind of conduct. And they said that there was insufficient evidence to support a claim for interference with fair housing rights. Well, let's see how that went. The, the basis under the, the motion for summary judgment, the assertion that there's no recognized claim for sexual harassment under the Fair Housing Act, the court strongly disagreed. The court also said there are sufficient facts. These are sufficient facts if established at trial to support a sexual harassment in housing claim. The court also disagreed with the third point here that a defendant cannot be held vicariously liable for its agent's harassment without establishing that the employer was negligent. And the court said clearly that is wrong, that HUD regs and case law hold uh, that vicarious liability is proper, and we're not using a Title VII employment discrimination analysis where we look for negligence on the part of the employer of the harasser. Here, um, under the interpretation of the Housing and Urban Development Department, which is one of the two federal agencies entrusted with enforcement of the Fair Housing Act and case law, vicarious liability flows to the employer of the harassing agent. So we're not looking to show that the company knew or should have known. Um, but the defendant did win with regard to the claim for interference with fair housing rights, finding that that claim should be dismissed.
So takeaways from this case that I wanted to get to you is that sexual harassment in housing is a form of illegal discrimination based on sex. It is a discriminatory housing practice. And that it's true that you'll often see courts look to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which deals with employment discrimination. There's a lot more case law that was developed sooner as compared to the Fair Housing Act. So a lot of courts do look at the development of standards for employment discrimination law when assessing housing discrimination cases, but not as to every aspect. There are some real differences, and the vicarious liability principles are one of the differences. So we're, many courts reject this Title VII employment discrimination negligence standard when looking at up the chain at the employer of the agent. And even one act of harassment, if severe or pervasive enough, may suffice as a discriminatory housing practice. This is something for the jury to decide, which is why this claim survived the defendant's motion for summary judgment. And this case also talks about how guidances issued by HUD and regulations that are in the Code of Federal Regulations are per persuasive interpretations that assist courts in applying the Fair Housing Act. Okay, please pause this presentation at this point and complete the survey below before continuing. This is required for you to get your continuing legal education or continuing education of any type credits. Now let's move on to the Bully versus Young Saborin case. This was um, another way to see the wide variety of factual situations that can be articulated as a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Here, briefly, the tenant was given a 30-day notice of termination of their lease immediately after domestic violence in the household occurred and following the rebuff of the landlord's attempt to discuss Christianity. The tenant didn't want to talk about Christianity and um, right after she had suffered some domestic violence in her household, it wasn't her that had done it, someone else, then she was given a 30-day notice of termination. These facts don't immediately appear. They're not the same wording of the language in the statute. Nonetheless, they do constitute a, pot a potential claim. The tenant here brought a Fair Housing Act claim asserting that the defendant terminated her lease because she was a victim of domestic violence and that that stood in for the category of sex because the vast majority of victims of domestic violence are of one particular sex, female. Also, she articulated a second claim based on discrimination based on religion because she refused defendants' attempts to discuss religion. And she was immediately served with an eviction notice. So looking back, how in the world does this claim be based on the Fair Housing Act? It's under subsection A, to refuse to sell or rent or to otherwise make unavailable or deny a dwelling. That's what happens when someone's evicted, the dwelling is made unavailable, and if it was done because of religion or because of sex, it violates subsection A. So she brought this claim. Um, the court like, looked at Title VII, the employment discrimination law, and used this very um, commonly understood burden shifting framework that has been developed in the employment discrimination context to look through the evidence and whether the parties had put forth enough to uh, survive summary judgment. Ultimately, the court denied the cross motions for summary judgment that were brought by each side and held that a reasonable jury could find that discrimination occurred, that this was a discriminatory housing practice based on sex or based on religion or both, and that likewise a jury could decide that it didn't meet the level of a discriminatory housing practice, but it was not going to be decided on summary judgment. Takeaways. <clears throat> Taking adverse action shortly after domestic violence or shortly after a discussion that provides evidence of being because of a protected class status should establish a prima facie case. And claims of housing discrimination that rely on circumstantial evidence may use this employment discrimination borrowed McDonnell Douglas uh, framework to figure out if the parties have met the burdens required to survive summary judgment. 
has, if plaintiff has established a prima facie case of discrimination, the burden shifts to the defendant to assert a legitimate non-discriminatory rationale for the challenged decision. And if the defendant is able to do so, the burden shifts back to the plaintiff, who then must demonstrate that the discrimination was the real reason that it was pretext. This alleged dis legitimate non-discriminatory rationale was just pretext for discrimination. And that's ultimately the plaintiff's burden of proving at trial. So this, this um, point here that domestic violence victims can assert claims under the Fair Housing Act is an important one. And these claims are based on the category of sex as sex discrimination, because any brief survey of the literature will tell us that the vast majority of victims of domestic violence are women. And I refer you to the wonderful source down at the bottom of this slide of the Relman Housing Discrimination Practice Manual if you wanna look at that issue further. So let's see if we can talk about disparate impact type claims. In this case, Rhode Island Commission for Human Rights versus Grawl does a good job of laying out these two different types of um, proof of discriminatory housing practices. So that's one reason I really like this portion of this opinion. The court talks about how discrimination is actionable, whether it is intentional discriminatory treatment or the unintended consequence of a facially neutral policy. That's what we're talking about with when we talk about discriminatory impact. So disparate treatment cases we've just been talking about are where plaintiff must establish that the defendant had a discriminatory intent or motive. And we can establish that through direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, the McDonnell Douglas burden shifting framework, or maybe all of those things. But if we're looking at a disparate impact type claim, that's challenging a different type of practice. That's challenging a practice that has a disproportionately adverse effect on a protected category or minority, racial minorities, and are otherwise unjustified by a legitimate rationale. So going off in a different direction. Here's another way of looking at it. Disparate treatment, we're looking for proof of membership in a protected group. That's usually easy to establish. Eligibility for housing or that you applied for the housing, denial of the housing, and conferring the benefit to someone outside the protected class or that housing opportunity remained available. That fourth element of disparate treatment is flexible. Disparate impact goes a different way. It's membership in a protected group, denial of a housing benefit, and instead of looking for intent, it's different. We're looking for a causal relationship between the denial of the housing benefit or opportunity and a facially neutral policy. So a disparate impact that disparately affects and adversely affects uh, a, a disproportionate number of a, a protected group and the benefit it remained available or was given to a non-member of the group. So in this case, how does this all play out? It's a good example of another type of housing discrimination claim. There was a tenant couple, a man and a woman, and they had a baby. Right after they had a baby, their landlord served notice that the family would have to move. They could not stay in their one bedroom. They needed to move to a two bedroom with a higher rent, or they needed to leave. And the letter said, there are these occupancy limits that make us um, do this, that preclude more than two persons in a one bedroom. And they offered a six month grace period to the couple and their baby if they paid a premium fee. So we'll let you stay in the one bedroom if you pay us extra. If you do not move or you do not pay extra, you'll be evicted. And a fair housing organization sent a tester who was told that um, also in when they attempted to apply for the a housing unit there, that they could not rent a one bedroom with a three person family. So this may not appear to some of you to be an obvious housing discrimination claim, but it is. It's a disparate impact case. The prima facie elements are shown with number one, membership in a protected group. Well, families with children. A baby was born, there's a family with children. Their protected category of familial status. 
Number two, the denial of a housing benefit. Well, they were told they must transfer to a two bedroom and pay more or they must leave. And there's additional evidence that this was the basis for um, the denial of a housing benefit. And it gives the tester standing as well as an aggrieved party. The tester who said, well, we're a family of, of three and we'd like a one bedroom was told they could not rent a one bedroom. Number three, a causal relationship between the denial and a facially neutral policy. So statistical evidence was brought in this case that the facially neutral policy that families of three must be in a two bedroom, not a one bedroom, facially neutral. It doesn't say we're targeting or um, only applying to families with children, but statistically, this causes a disproportionate percentage of denials of housing opportunities to families with children because there are just not many families of three that are three adults. So compared to the percentage of families without children, it's the families with children who are impacted by this facially neutral policy. And that's the causal relationship. And then the benefit remained available or was given to a non-member of the group while the housing was available to a larger percentage of families without children. <clears throat> families defined as one individual or two individual, those are mostly families without children. So the prima facie case for disparate impact was properly articulated here. And once again, showing the differences between a disparate treatment case, where if a plaintiff establishes a prima facie case of disparate treatment, this rebuttable presumption of discrimination is raised. It shifts the burden to the defendant to show a legitimate non-discriminatory reason to rebut this presumption, and the plaintiff has an opportunity to rebut with evidence of pretext. Well, looking at disparate impact, which is what this Grawl case was about, once the plaintiff establishes this prima facie case of disparate impact, it raises an inference of discrimination, and the burden shifts to the defendant to justify and show that a valid interest is served by the policies. A legitimate and substantial goal to rebut the inference of discrimination. And in this case, it was held that the defendant failed to produce a justification that was legitimate as it was regarding this family and this neutral policy. So the plaintiff was awarded um, summary judgment. There was recently in 2015, the US Supreme Court affirmed the fact that disparate impact is a possible means of going about proving a claim for violation of the Fair Housing Act. And uh, it followed along what we just talked about as far as what the prima facie case is made up of, that the defendant used a neutral policy in making housing related decisions a class of persons protected by the Fair Housing Act was harmed more than others, and that this disparity, this disproportionality was actually caused by the defendant's policy. So that's the prima facie case. If the plaintiff establishes this prima facie disparate impact, then the burden shifts to the defendant to show that its challenged policy is necessary to achieve a valid interest. And if that is done, the burden shifts back to the plaintiff who can still prevail by showing that this interest of the defendant can be served by a policy with a less discriminatory effect. So I wanted to talk briefly about this Huntington Branch NAACP versus Town of Huntington case because this shows how zoning decisions can also run afoul of the Fair Housing Act and result in a claim and litigation. In this case, a plaintiff developer sought to construct an integrated multifamily subsidized apartment in what was an almost all white neighborhood. So the plaintiff was the developer, the, the constructor or um, housing developer. There was a zoning ordinance in effect that limited private construction of multifamily apartments to areas that were 52% minority, non-white into these urban renewal areas and only the public housing authority could build elsewhere. So the zoning ordinance itself was getting in the way 
of what the plaintiff private property developer wanted to build because of the zoning. The, there was a petition for a change in the zoning so that this plaintiff developer could develop the um, subsidized apartments in this neighborhood and the town refused it. Litigation ensued, there were various decisions, ultimately appealed and the second circuit held that the lower court incorrectly relied on lack of evidence of intent. There wasn't discriminatory intent evidence in the case below. Um, when the town refused the petition for a change in, change in the zoning so that the selected parcel could be developed, um, there wasn't evidence that this was done with discriminatory intent. The second circuit said, you don't need this. This is a disparate impact case that has been successfully articulated by the plaintiff. And what the court said is when a decision here by a township's zoning um, entity produces a discriminatory effect on the community that perpetuates segregation and prevents interracial association, it will be considered invidious under the Fair Housing Act independently of the extent to which it produces a disparate effect on different racial groups. So what this case establishes is that decisions that perpetuate segregation, by which we mean segregation on a racial basis, is an independent way of establishing a Fair Housing Act violation. This is in addition to other claims that were present in this type of case, uh, showing of a dis disproportionate effect on Blacks of the decision, because that was what we had here, was the racial makeup was an all white neighborhood and the housing decision not allowing the developer to build in the neighborhood it wished to develop was going to have a disproportionate effect on uh, black individuals who wanted housing opportunities. So no intent needed to be established for either type of claim. The court here, the second circuit held that the township violated the Fair Housing Act by refusing to amend the zoning ordinance to permit private developers to build multifamily dwellings outside this designated urban renewal area. And it violated the Fair Housing Act by refusing to rezone the particular parcel that the developer had identified and wanted to develop. The holding indicates that a dwelling may be made otherwise unavailable, that's the exact language of the statute, by an action that limits the affordability of housing. Another case with similarities to um, Huntington Gardens involved a local redevelopment plan and the claims made here were disparate impact based on race and perpetuation of racial segregation. In this case, there was a proposed redevelopment plan that would tear down homes in one particular neighborhood, the Gardens neighborhood, and replace them with significantly more expensive units. And that was according to the township's redevelopment plan. This happened to be the only neighborhood in the township of mostly African-American and Hispanic residents. And there was a lot of not good stuff happening there where they were out overcrowding, there was crime and blight, and landlords were pretty absent. Uh, so this redevelopment plan included some wording about what would happen to those people who lived in this neighborhood that was being torn down, but none really explained how people would be relocated. The plaintiff was a community group which had standing to sue as a plaintiff and they sued the, the defendant local government, the township was a defendant for violation of the Fair Housing Act. The claims were based on um, a showing that the redevelopment plan demolished the only minority neighborhood in the township. And they brought in statistical evidence that would support a prima facie case of housing discrimination based on disparate impact. And statistics were used to show that the impact was going to be felt by over 22% of African-American households, 32% of Hispanic households, and only 2.73% of white households in the township. That's a disproportionate impact. That's a prima facie case of it. 
The district court um, was held by the Third Circuit, which reversed it, to have made a mistake when it refused these statistics. The, um, the Third Circuit said the district court should have viewed these statistics offered by the plaintiff in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. And the issue is whether minorities are disproportionately affected by the redevelopment plan. What we learned from this case, among other things, is that disparate impact analysis reaches conduct that has the necessary and foreseeable consequence of perpetuating segregation. Remember, that's one of the two purposes of the Fair Housing Act is to eliminate residential segregation and promote balanced, integrated living patterns. That's in the statute itself. The effect of perpetuating segregation here by decisions of a township about redevelopment plans can be as deleterious as purposefully discriminatory conduct in frustrating the national commitment to replace the ghettos with truly integrated and balanced living patterns. The prima facie case of disparate impact discrimination is made with a showing that an action disproportionately burdens a particular group. And here, it's a good time to look at what the regulations tell us. In 24 Code of Federal Regulations 100.500, there is a definition of how to understand this liability for discriminatory effect. And there's a lot of really important and helpful information around this same area of the Code of Federal Regulations about housing discrimination. So this section defines liability for a practice that has an unjustified discriminatory effect that can attach to either public or private parties as follows. And then it outlines um, and interprets the law in ways similar to what we've already been talking about, but it's right there in the Code of Federal Regulations for us. The charging party or the plaintiff must first prove its prima facie case, which is done with a practice that results in or would predictably result in a discriminatory effect on the basis of a protected, uh, protected characteristic. And then two, if the charging party establishes this prima facie case, the burden shifts to the defendant to prove that this challenged practice is necessary to achieve one or more of its substantial legitimate non-discriminatory interests. Three, if the defendant satisfies this burden, then the charging party may still establish liability by proving that the substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interest could be served by a practice that has a less discriminatory effect. In 2013, HUD issued its final rule on disparate impact and it formalized the agency's long-held view that the Fair Housing Act encompasses these two types of discriminatory effects. One, harm to a particular group of persons by disparate impact. That's what that regulation in the previous slide talked about. But also, it can be established through the discriminatory effect of harm to the community generally by creating, increasing, reinforcing, or perpetuating segregated housing patterns. And here is that um, case that went to the Supreme Court. I wanted to talk a little bit about what this case, um, how this case came about. Inclusive Communities Project versus Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Well, who were the parties in this case that made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, which in that case reaffirmed what the circuit courts had been saying for a long time, but the Supreme Court had never said before, which is that disparate impact is a viable way, a theory of proving a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Well, in this case, the plaintiff was a nonprofit community organization with a partial fair housing mission. So it had standing as an aggrieved party to seek a remedy under the Fair Housing Act. The defendant was a state agency in Texas that administers federal low-income housing tax credit program for Texas. 
And what were the facts that under, underpinned this case? The state agency defendant was alleged to have disproportionately awarded tax credits for developers constructing low-income housing in minority neighborhoods and denying non-senior housing development applications in white neighborhoods, and that that also otherwise perpetuated racial segregation. You can see how the claim here was both based on disparate impact and uh, perpetuation of racial segregation. The district court found that a prima facie case was established based on evidence that the state agency did the following. It approved tax credits for low-income housing development by private developers in minority neighborhoods but not in white neighborhoods. And statistics and experts were brought in to show how the numbers uh, worked out. And that applications of proposed non-elderly units versus applications for elderly units were granted or not granted in ways that looked dis very disproportional when you looked at the race of the areas in which the developments were proposed and that also the state agency otherwise perpetuated racial segregation in that 92.29% of the low-income housing tax credit units in the Dallas area were located in census tracts with less than 50% Caucasian residents. Okay, so that established a prima facie case without any need to allege that anything, any conduct was done with the intent to discriminate or with a discriminatory animus or with a motive based on race. It was that these neutral policies disproportionately impacted um, people based on race and neighborhoods by perpetuating racial segregation. Let's look back at the statutory language again of subsection A of the Fair Housing Act. It's unlawful to otherwise make unavailable or deny a dwelling to any person because of race. That's where this comes from. And I hadn't mentioned before, but there's also a portion of the Fair Housing Act under 3605 that deals with real estate professionals or those who are involved in real estate transactions as a business. So in general, it's unlawful for any person or other entity whose business includes engaging in residential real estate related transactions to discriminate against any person in making available such a transaction or in the terms and conditions because of seven protected categories. And this includes the making or purchasing of loans or providing other financial assistance for purchasing, constructing, improving, repairing, or maintaining a dwelling or uh, financial assistance secured by residential real estate and, and things like selling, brokering, or appraising. So you can see how all these things combined make it easy to understand how a state agency that is involved in awarding low-income housing tax credits to developers, private and nonprofit developers, uh, could run afoul of the Fair Housing Act. So when the Supreme Court finally got this case, here's what it said. The Fair Housing Act, like Title VII and the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, was enacted to eradicate discriminatory practices within a sector of the economy. It includes zoning laws and other housing restrictions that function unfairly to exclude minorities from certain neighborhoods without any sufficient justification. That suits targeting such practices reside at the heartland of disparate impact liability. But just demonstrating a discriminatory effect, those numbers I showed you, those proportions of who lives where and the, the racial makeup of the neighborhood, that alone, the court said, does not impose liability. Plaintiffs must show that the challenged policy caused the disparate effect 
And the burden shifting framework we've talked about allows a defendant to justify its challenged policy. So there was a real focus by the Supreme Court on causation, on that being a very necessary component of establishing liability. Back to the flow chart. We've been talking about proof, proving Fair Housing Act claims through disparate treatment or showing that decisions were made um, intentionally because of someone's membership in a protected class. And this could be done through direct evidence or circumstantial evidence or both. Or the other route mainly is through disparate impact where there's an opportunity to justify the practice despite its discriminatory impact. But then if the defendant does articulate a, a legitimate reason justifying the practice, the plaintiff can still prevail by showing there's a less discriminatory way to accomplish the same thing. One important point that I wanted to touch on, and it's codified here in the CFR, that only disparate impact claims provide an affirmative defense to justify them. So what are we talking about here? Well, back up to the flow chart here. If the um, plaintiff establishes disparate treatment, that whatever the decision was, was based on membership in a protected category, there is no affirmative defense available. And this is one way that is really a different um, layout than it is in the employment discrimination world. Disparate effect or disparate impact, there's an opportunity to justify what has happened as a result of the neutral policy. So a demonstration that a practice is supported by a legally justi uh, sufficient justification is allowed for disparate impact only. It's not an affirmative defense against a claim of intentional discrimination. There is no valid justification for intentional discrimination in housing based on protected class status. And that's a really important point. All right, let's see how this type of case is framed with regard to a zoning case. It's important that we understand that zoning is among um, the, uh, the types of housing discrimination claims that are frequently litigated, um, especially zoning that regards where people with disabilities can live in group homes. In this case, an applicant for an adult foster care license for a group home for adult foster care sued the state of Michigan. So our plaintiff is the entity seeking to open uh, an adult foster care home and the defendant is the state of Michigan. After the, state, the state's statutory scheme resulted in the city of Westland denying the application for the license. There was a state law in place and it required state licensing entities to notify local city governments and allowed it to cause rejection of applications for these adult foster care homes if there was another adult foster care facility already in the neighborhood within 1500 feet. So the two components of the state law that were challenged were this notification requirement that if there's an application coming in, the state licensing entity has to notify the local government before issuing the license and the spacing requirement that results in rejection if another adult foster care facility is within a certain number of feet. So that was the basis for this lawsuit. The Court of Appeal affirmed the district court's decision in favor of the plaintiff, holding that the statute was preempted by the Federal Housing Amendments Act. What are we talking about? Well, the So the Court of Appeal affirmed the district court's decision in favor of the plaintiff and held that the statute, the Michigan statute, was preempted by the Fair Housing Amendments Act. Now that's not something I've mentioned before, but essentially 
the disability components of the Fair Housing Act were added by the Fair Housing Amendments Act in 1988. Okay, so what happened? The Sixth Circuit said that the Fair Housing Amendments Act makes it unlawful to otherwise make unavailable or deny housing because of handicap. Like I said, that's when the discrimination law was amended to include as a protected category disability, people with disabilities, and that's subsection F. The court said it's well settled that the Fair Housing Amendments Act applies to the regulation of group homes for persons with disabilities, and that Congress, in fact, explicitly intended the Fair Housing Amendments Act to apply to these situations, to zoning ordinances, and that federal law preempts state law when the two conflict. Also, the Fair Housing Amendments Act is explicit on this point. Here, Michigan's statutory scheme that required those two components, the notification, if there was an application for a license for an adult um, uh, group home, and the spacing requirements that could allow for rejection, those components of the statutory scheme are facially discriminatory. This is not a disparate impact claim. This is disparate treatment because it only applies to group homes for people with disabilities. It's on its face discriminatory because it treats people with disabilities different, differently. It applies only to homes for people with disabilities and the Sixth Circuit rejected the state of Michigan's argument that there's no discriminatory intent because there's a benign motive. And this is where the precedent in the employment law area of Johnson Controls squarely refutes. So I mentioned there was borrowing with employment discrimination, and here's one where the borrowing causes the housing discrimination um, law to develop in alignment with employment discrimination law, that it doesn't matter if the discrimination is done for a benign reason, because we want good things to happen for people with disabilities or whatever the argument is, there is no justification allowed for discriminatory intent here where the statute on its face only applies when we're trying to house people with disabilities. That's intentional discrimination. So the, the court also looked back at this employment uh, discrimination framework of McDonnell Douglas, where it's used to establish disparate treatment through circumstantial evidence. We establish a prima facie case, the burden shifts to the, the defendant here, the state of Michigan, to articulate a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for its spacing and notification policy. And then the plaintiff has a chance to show that the reason articulated is pretext for discrimination. Well, that's where we're trying to establish disparate treatment with, with circumstantial evidence because we don't have direct evidence. But here it doesn't apply. We don't need the McDonnell Douglas framework where there's direct evidence of intentional discrimination. Here, the court points out, the statute is facially discriminatory we already can see that the treatment is being made because of membership in a protected class of persons with disabilities. So where there's direct evidence of disparate treatment in age discrimination and other employment discrimination under Title VII, the only statutory affirmative defenses that are available are those that involve a bona fide occupational qualification. Right? There are some narrow exceptions in the employment discrimination law realm where even where it's intentionally discriminatory, an employment decision can be justified with a bona fide occupational qualification. We must have only women working in our women's spa and locker room to protect the privacy of people who frequent the locker room. So there's some very narrow opportunities to justify intentional discrimination in employment with a BFOQ. Title VIII, which is where the Federal Fair Housing Act is codified, the um, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, 
does not have any statutory affirmative defenses to intentional discrimination. If the Fair Housing Act covers a housing related transaction involving a dwelling, there's no affirmative defense for intentional discrimination. That's an important point made by the Sixth Circuit in this case. There are exemptions to coverage. We've briefly talked about those for the single family home sold or rented by an owner who's not in the real estate business and without using any agent or any discriminatory advertising. There are exemptions for owner occupied buildings with four or fewer units. There's a narrow exemption for religious organizations and a narrow exemption for private clubs and a narrow exemption for familial status discrimination against families with children only in senior housing that meets the statutory definitions for that type of housing. And there's also a direct threat exemption when there's um, evidence of an individualized threat that housing a person or providing an opportunity to a person would allow. But here in this Larkin case, where a statute facially discriminates against persons with disabilities, a violation of the Fair Housing Act is established unless the defendant can demonstrate that the established discrimination against persons with disabilities is warranted by the unique and specific needs and abilities of those handicapped persons to whom the regulations apply. And here, the court found that there was insufficient evidence that the spacing and notification requirements of the statute were warranted by the unique and specific needs and abilities of people with disabilities. So takeaways from Larkin. Dispersal requirements regarding the housing of persons with disabilities do not generally survive court challenge. Statutory scheme that applies zoning requirements only to homes for persons with disabilities is disparate treatment and intentional discrimination. Um, there's no rational legal basis for arguing that dispersal prevents the formation of ghettos or normalizes the environment that was not sufficient evidence to survive in that case. The absence of a malevolent motive does not convert a facially discriminatory policy into a neutral policy with a discriminatory effect. You can see how the defendant, Michigan in that case, was trying to argue that it was a disparate impact case that they could use a justification of their legitimate goals to justify what the policy was. And the court wasn't having it because it was a facially discriminatory statute. Also a takeaway from Larkin is that integration, even though that's a goal of the Fair Housing Act, does not justify quotas, right? Especially where the burden of the, burden of the quota falls upon the disadvantaged minority. So, there were arguments made in that case that the statute requiring notification and dispersal of group homes for persons with disabilities was justified by a policy of, by a, a goal of neighborhood integration. We don't want all the homes for people with disabilities to be clumped up together. That's a valid argument or a valid policy we want to promote integrated neighborhoods, but it doesn't justify quotas, right? Especially where the burden of the quota results in fewer opportunities for the disadvantaged minority, their persons with disabilities, to find housing. Okay, back to our flowchart. I hope this has made more and more sense as we've gone through it. The disparate treatment method of analyzing a case where you can show that the discriminatory housing practice was done with intent to treat people differently because of their membership in a protected category. And the alternate route of a disparate effect where you're not even attempting to show what the intent be behind the practice or the decision was, but just that the effect disproportionately harms or impacts people based on their membership in a protected category or group. And there's a chance for the defendant to justify the practice despite the disproportionate effect and a chance for the plaintiff to show that this same um, goal can be advanced through a less discriminatory practice. 
Thank you for viewing today's presentation. This is the information for opening the final survey that will allow you to complete your continuing education requirements. I very much appreciate High Plains Fair Housing Center having invited me to do this recorded presentation. I hope it was useful and will be helpful to you in the future. So thank you very much and have a great day.